Welcome, Dr. Edith Hall. Thank you for coming on. Um, Dr. Edith Hall is a professor in the Department of Classics and Ancient History at Durham University, and she specializes in Greek literature. She's published over 30 books, including Aristotle's Way, How Ancient Wisdom Can Change Your Life. She makes frequent appearances on the radio and television, and she also has a YouTube channel where she makes the classics accessible to the general public. Her latest episode was an interesting one where she discussed Homer's Iliad and the environmental crisis. I watched that, I listened to that, that was good. Uh, so welcome Dr. Edith, I'm honored to have you here today. Thank you so much, I'm delighted to be here. So first thing I wanna ask is about you actually. Um, what, you've been in philosophy all your life, practically. You've done so many books, published so many books. What, what drives you in this field? What got you interested? How do you say interested? How are you so passionate? I don't know why I'm um, so passionate uh, about trying to live my life in a way that leaves the world and the people in it uh, and the animals in it and everything in it a better place than I arrived in it. I mean, I think that is just a matter of cast of personality. You know, some people on the sort of whole spectrum of humanity uh, are very much not interested in, in, in the general welfare uh, and others are, and I, I always have been. My mother tells me that even as a very small child, I was um, uh, had a social conscience. Uh, I mean, I, I find this quite strange, but I do remember I mean, when I was eight years old, my parents found me weeping in front of the television. That was in the late 1960s when there was terrible stuff, famine, starvation of children in Biafra as a result of British imperial policy in Africa. Uh, of course, which I didn't understand at all. I knew nothing of the politics of it, but I just couldn't understand why there were all these children who were starving to death. It, it, and I remember saying to mum, why can't we just put all the food in the shops on a plane and fly, fly it straight to Africa? I, I couldn't understand it. And actually, you know what? I still don't quite understand it. <laughs> with all the money in the world there must, there's something wrong with the system um something deeply wrong with the system uh i've come to believe as a socialist that it's to do with the economic system and i didn't at eight years old think that at all but i do think i've got a rather overdeveloped empathetic uh streak which isn't always a good thing if it's too extreme right because you've got to look after your own you can't give everything away to everybody else. Yes. And my husband's had to be quite strict with me ab about that because uh, when I first got the job at King's College London, my previous job, to get from the tube station to the university, you have to walk over at least 10 tramps, okay? Always, they're just there on the strand. And I was giving five pound notes to every one of them. Um, every day and my husband was saying why is there 60 pounds coming out of the bank account so I mean I'm laughing at it it's not at all a laughing matter but actually that's a real moral problem in our society is if you love your neighbor as yourself which I take as the only commandment there is only one commandment as far as I'm concerned that you love your neighbor as yourself because that even includes thou shalt not kill right because you're not going to yeah. kill them if you have that is the only commandment that i have kept since losing my own religious faith if you love your neighbor as yourself then how can you sit and eat a beautiful meal every night when there are people without anything to eat across the whole world it, it, it is a really big problem and you have to find your way you have to find some way of reconciling yourself to the suffering around you while committing yourself to a life that at least tries to do something to ameliorate it. Okay, thank you. So the very value-driven uh, kind of course, course of uh, or trajectory of life. I think it's something to do with family position. I've, I've, I've read quite a lot. I'm third out of four <laughs> children. Um, and actually the third children apparently have a tendency to be both quite rebellious and because they have to fight hard. I certainly had to fight hard to get my fair share with two big, strong, older mm -hmm. brother and sister. Because you had to fight quite hard to get your share. Uh, you had more, 
more of a sense of community than say say a first child. I don't know if there's anything in that, but apparently my very first word was each. Okay. Right. <laughs> Just each because food was going around and I wasn't getting any. So it was like each. So it's almost a sort of commu communitarian politics to childhood. What position in the family are you? I'm the eldest. You're the eldest. <laughs> I got the attention. You, you tend to be the very uh, the first children of over responsible. That's a different thing. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed that. They tend to they tend to take the position of leadership and feel they've got to look after everybody, rather than be the rebel. Mm. This is what I've read. In classical times, we inherited everything as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's uh, go back to the Greeks then, which is your yes. speciality. Um, the question of the good life, it seems every great civilization has its uh, theories. And the first, you could say, great great civilization on, in the history of humans was, was the Greeks. Um, just the, the wealth of knowledge that in, emerged out of that small region um, changed the course of history. And well, one of the I wouldn't say they were the first great civilization. I, I mean, the... Sumerians, Babylonians, Phoenicians, and Egyptians had much more ancient civilizations. What they didn't do was develop a secular moral philosophy. Yeah, right? suppose... they, did discuss, they did discuss what is it to live a good life, but they defined it purely in terms of living in accordance with the rules set down by gods. The and great breakthrough, from my point of view, of the Greeks was they said, well, well, actually, it's possible there are no gods who are interested in how we behave. That is a, a distinct possibility. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the intellectuals, like not Plato, but Aristotle, did not think he, he wasn't an atheist, but he didn't think that gods were at all concerned with our day to day behavior or, and, or would punish it or anything like that. So they set about. Uh, thinking about how should we figure out how to behave to each other if there isn't a rule book coming down from a superior power, if you see what I mean. And that is a very, very great contribution because I think that uh, sort of secular ethics are something that could really help our world uh, because they're not incompatible with most religions. So they can be a truly cosmopolitan, interreligious, interfaith, way of talking about being a good person so I, I am a passionate believer that this could actually transcend a lot of the problems that we get with strife between different religious systems yeah so I think yeah uh, I suppose the Greeks they kind of um, they emerge at a time of writing I think writing came 500 BC and that's also what propelled the Greeks a little bit yeah and yeah, as, as, and the secular ethics is a, is a good point to mention because I don't think other civilizations have done the same either. Well, not until very recently. And in fact, the Greeks did it for, uh, these, this emerges in about 450, 450 years before Christ BC. Um, and it goes on for nearly a thousand years. Uh, and we can talk about the different schools. It's not just Aristotelianism, there's Stoics and Epicureans and Platonists, yeah. but different schools of thought discussing all of these ideas for nearly a thousand years. But then the universities at which they were discussed in the Greek speaking cities of the Eastern Mediterranean world uh, and the Levant and, and North Africa and all the way up to the Black Sea, West Turkey, those were all shut down by. Christians, okay? So by the Byzantines in the Eastern part of the, empire, of, of the old Roman empire and by the Catholic church, they simply shut down the universities because everybody, they, they thought secular morality was evil. It was the work of Satan. Everybody should believe in the Christian God. And with that, of course, also went persecution of other faiths, including Muslims and Jews. And persecution when Northern Europeans started uh, bringing empires to the rest of the world of other religions like Hinduism or Confucianism or Buddhism. So faith became an actual enemy of this kind of 
secular morality. And it was not until the 18th century. So with the French Enlightenment, the con continental Enlightenment, when people like Voltaire again started saying, well, actually, there may not be a God. <laughs> you know, can, can we discuss what is it to live a good life without reference to the Bible? Before that, you'd be likely to be imprisoned or burned as a heretic. Yeah. Uh, so our phase of it is actually only about 300 years old. And we're very lucky that you and I are free <laughs> in what is officially a Christian country <laughs> when neither of us is a Christian. Yeah to sit and have this conversation in public discourse. This is a privilege. It is, most of the world, this wouldn't be allowed. Exactly. I think even in the UAE right now, you can't uh, you can't import books of like Dawkins or anything like that right now. Really? Yeah. Um, I've got a friend who I have to, when I visit him, I have to bring him in my suitcase. <laughs> I, I can quite believe that, but there again, there are also uh, judges in the Southern states of the USA who, who ban the teaching of Darwinian evolution, you know, it's not it's, it's not just Islam. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it tends to be the more doctrinaire monotheisms, all of them. Yeah, um, but that's yeah. We can we can discuss that another day, maybe. <laughs> it's a massive massive topic. Uh, but again, back to the Greeks, we have yeah. we have Aristotle, we've got Plato, we've got Epicurus, and then later on we get some uh, Stoics, we get Zeno, and then the Romans as well. All these people grappling with the idea of a good life, yeah. and different versions of it as well, which, as you can imagine, would emerge as people have different um, uh, ways of thinking. Yeah. Uh, and the term they use is, this is where my pronunciation isn't really good, I do, I've heard eudaimonia, I've heard eudaimonia, I've heard Eudaimonia. <laughs> well, the for the ancient Greeks, it was eudaimonia. Eudaimonia. Yeah. Okay. To stress on the I. Most British philosophers say eudaimonia. Uh, it's just mm. a traditional yeah. way of pr pronouncing Greek in, in, in an English way. Uh, eudaimonia would be the, the normal way of saying it. But it's a very strange word. Because it's yeah, weirdly, it really translate to happiness directly, does it? It has been translated happiness, but that is very confusing because it's too big. Uh, the word in happiness uh, is far too big because it also includes things that Aristotle uh, and other philosophers in antiquity would never have regarded as what they meant as eudaimonia, which is like instant transcendent pleasure. You know, having an ice cream. Uh, are you happy today? Happy birthday, have a happy meal. That sort of temporary state of being in pleasure. Uh, for Aristotle, eudaimonia means to live in a way that um, is much more about serenity and contentment and self-fulfillment. I like the English word, well, it's Latin, felicity, a state of felicity, because that doesn't imply something you can get from eating an ice cream. <laughs> Um, it implies a much more permanent uh, state of mind. So I also see you, John, I prefer to use it as a verb. It's to live well, to be doing something. It's actually an active process, not a passive state of ecstasy. It, you have to make a commitment to uh, pursuing eudaimonia through a certain kind of moral behaviour. Uh, so... It is pretty tricky translating it happiness. Some philosophers translate it as to, to flourish, to lead a flourishing life, one that one that uh, fulfills you in all your different functions as an animal, as a human, as an intellect, as a spirit, as a community member. Uh, to live well has got its own problems because and the good life, because a lot of people associate that with simply winning the lottery, you know, the good life getting a fast car uh, and being able to spend a lot of money at casinos. And this is nothing to do with the ancient Greek yeah. philosophical idea of the good life. And even Epicurus, people might say he's a hedonist when he said pleasure is the highest good, but it's not the pleasure we think it is, is no. it? <laughs> no. Um, now, even in antiquity, people deliberately exploited the ambiguity. The word is head on air, as in, Mm -hmm. hedonism 
that that ambiguity was already there in ancient Greek is is uh, pleasure, freedom from pain, which is actually how Epicurus translated it. I or no hassles, right? Ataraxia, like calm and serenity, or is it actually sort of the active pleasure of stimulating your appetite for food or for sex or for any of the other bodily things? People attack the Epicureans, and even in antiquity, but it wasn't until really the Renaissance that hedonism in English came to mean something so negative, as opposed to uh, the pursuit of, of, of a calm and pain-free, opposite of pain, life. I see. And where does ethics fit into the picture of, because we're talking about pain and pleasure over here and happiness, these are emotions and things we feel. Where does, we don't feel ethics, where does, or our principles, where does ethics fit into this idea of uh, a dominia, if I'm saying that correctly? Okay, so early on, in fact, pretty much with Plato, Socrates, who was Plato's teacher, but didn't write anything. And then Plato, philosophy clearly gets split into three separate departments, okay? One of them is ethics, but the other two are things that people actually sort of make fun. It's a stereotype of philosophy. One is ontology, and that means what is being. So those are the big questions like how, you know, what's his existence? Is there a God? Uh, what is being? Uh, what is my consciousness? You know, what is, what is it to be this thing that I am? Sort of existential issues. The second is epistemology, which means the study of knowledge. How do we know things? What is knowledge? Can we believe the newspapers? How can we test a piece of information to see if it's true or not? And it's incredibly important, obviously, and I think in the age of the internet, uh, and false information epistemology has become even more important. But the third big branch is ethics. Ethics means your ethos is the type of person you are. It's your, your individuality, your personhood, but it also includes every question of how should we live? What are the rules for behavior? And that subsumes politics, right? Politics, political theory grew as a branch of ethics. They're pretty much inseparable because as soon as we start talking about how um, I treat you or how I treat my children or how I treat my neighbor, <laughs> we're getting into how I treat my fellow citizen and then mm -hmm. what is society for. So although Aristotle wrote two separate books, one called The Ethics and one called The Politics, and one is more focused on how you treat people in your individual relationships, and one is more how do we all behave together as a society, they're seamless. The principles underlying them are exactly the same. So what we're really talking today in this podcast is only one branch of ancient Greek philosophy, uh, because I think it's by far the most important in everyday people's lives, how we decide to treat each other, uh, of course has some aspects of epistemology in it. How do I know that you're telling the truth or whatever? But the overwhelming thing is, is there any point in me being nice to you? Is there any point whatsoever in us treating each other recipro with reciprocal goodwill, because an awful lot of society is telling you no. I think the whole capitalist system brings us up to try to get the best for ourselves, right? Get as much money for yourself and possibly your very immediate household at the expense of everybody else. It's all set up as a competition. So if one person wins, the other loses. I think it's actually one of the great problems of capitalism is in the way the very free market capitalism that, that we're heading towards in this country right now is precisely that it takes no account of the need to look after your neighbour as yourself. Yeah and it's hard to say because as humans we want to be happy and if we, if we define happiness as getting lots of money which the capitalist system might, might do um, well, I, th I think that the, I think there is a relationship between money and happiness. I think the 
relationship is that if you have not got enough to That's live like a, 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 com a just comfortable standard of living without too much anxiety in any given society, so it's relative to the society, then your ability to pursue happiness ethically and morally is severely limited. But once you've got just enough, you don't get any happier with any more, right? So I think that is a relationship, but it's a, only to do with lack. And Aristotle himself saw that. He said, if you're fighting every minute of every day to get the next meal on the table for your children, then you have very little time to spend worrying about moral philosophy. Yeah. And uh, it impedes your ability to exercise virtue, doesn't it? The well? most unhappy people I have, I have ever met, truly unhappy, have all been very rich. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In because they, they, have, they have lost all sense usually of how to be happy in a relationship or how to be happy just looking at nature, right? That it, it sort of corrupting desire to accumulate more and more and more. Yeah, and, and here's, uh, humans, we want to be happy, but we also want to be ethical, we want to live meaningful lives. And how does Aristotle see the two intersect each other? Well, Aristotle very firmly believes that by trying to treat other people well and think about things in a collective way in terms of groups, not just individuals, that you will, if you do that, you will be happier than if you don't. And he thinks there's two reasons for that. There's sort of extraneous reasons. That is clearly, if I'm nice to you, there's a much bigger chance you'll be kind to me back, right? If I'm nice to my children, they're much more likely to love me as they grow up and um, be kind to me. But he, he thinks it goes beyond, that's, that is what I would call enlightened self-interest, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be happy and you're gonna be happier if other people are nice to you, so you invest niceness outwards. But he says it goes far beyond that. If by practicing trying to be a good person, if you do that all the time, he says, internally, you get an uh, internal self-sufficient uh, calm uh, and sense that you're on a positive journey, which it's very, what he calls teleological. That means looking towards the end. He thinks everything and everybody has got a, a telos, which is a, sort of perfected form of themselves. Mm -hmm. And ultimately your telos is being able to lie on your deathbed. And he talks about this quite honestly, knowing that you tried your hardest. If you made mistakes, it wasn't from bad motives. It was because of bad luck. So sort of always thinking, will I be ashamed of this on my deathbed? <laughs> if you like, um, will I be able to lie on my deathbed knowing I just, did my best by everybody it is a really guiding force so he encourages people to think of their lives as a whole arc you're, you're living every day as part of a continuum and you're trying to improve so he says you will both get to be more happy in your relationships because people will be nicer to you and you will also even if you're in solitary confinement you know and under the most terrible hardships and isolation if you know deep in yourself you're trying to do your best, then you're going to be a lot stronger and happier than if you resort to behaving in a very uh, selfish or, or difficult way. Uh, whatever other people say about you, you know. So it's like creating this battery inside you of self-sufficiency. We could talk uh, later about how you actually go around achieving that. What, what is it to be, uh, to try to be a good person? But it does take an effort and a commitment. You can't just, uh, it's not like, you can't just have one injection of eudaimonia. <laughs> You've got to do it got all day, you. every day. But the good thing is about that is, uh, I always use the analogy of learning to drive a car. I, I'm not quite sure what the equivalent would be in ancient Greece, learning to drive a chariot or something. But that, you know, when you first start learning to drive a car, you have to think every time you change gear, 
every time should mm. I go up into first or second or third, it does become unconscious. So he says, if, if you habitually do the right thing, right, you habitually make the choice to treat someone altruistically and fairly rather than unpleasantly or to bitch behind their backs or gossip yeah. or, or, or whatever, if you habitually do it, it does start to uh, become automatic. And, and I felt that in my own life. Yeah. And what's interesting is that um, for some reason, biology or evolution, you could however we want to frame it. Um, when we do good things, we do feel happy. Like if yep. we do charity, we feel good. Um, if we know we were just in a situation when we could have been corrupt, we feel good. And we have a rewarding mechanism in ourselves for exercising what we've... What I, think I think even neuroscience has begun to prove that. That pleasure parts of the brain fire up when yeah. people do. I think it can. I think. I think it can actually be proven to do with the so electric. It's, it's quite convenient that uh, good doing good things makes us happy because uh, it'd be very tricky if being good meant it made us unhappy. Yes. So I think Aristotle was on was was, was really onto something here. Yeah. The, the the worst thing of all is to go to bed at night knowing you did something really horrible to someone. I mean, I still do that occasionally uh, uh, um, because your emotions can get, you know, you can get carried away however hard you try not ever to lose your temper or uh, whatever, uh, do something selfish, um, stab someone in the back when they're not looking. I don't mean physically, but you know what I mean? Yeah. However much you try, and I, fi I, I find it really very difficult to sleep now if I've done that. So it's much, much, much better just not to do it. And you, you touched on t um, the telos just there. Uh, I think Aristotle has his, uh, a function argument. I think Plato might have defined it earlier, where he links um, humans are happy when we're fulfilling our function. Yeah. And he, I think he mentions that for us is using our reason which is a very interesting way of looking at fulfilling a function. I wonder it if is. Is, is reason for him exercising logical faculties or is it something a bit different We're imbued with virtue? Well, this is, this is really complicated, but you're absolutely right. It's very distinctively Aristotelian. The basic thing to get hold of is that all the other ancient philosophical systems and religions were binary. Right, so there is virtue and there is vice, right? There is bravery and there is cowardice. There is uh, anger, bad, calm, good. Um, so it's all very binary like that. And this, this, this extends to basically even, you know, sex, sexual desire, bad, right? Yeah. Being very self sexually self-controlled, good um whatever the thing is is it's binary it's a battle between emotion or instinct on one side and reason on the other now aristotle absolutely discarded that he's the only one who did he said that emotion and reason the analogy he actually uses is, is like the concave and convex sides of a spoon that they're sort of aiming at the same thing but with two different faces and that all human instincts and emotions, all of them are on a spectrum between too much excess and deficiency, not enough. And that happiness, the good life, the ethically good way, is actually where you get them exactly right in the appropriate balance in the middle. Now, I'm a very emotional person. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a very physical person, I'm a very, very enthusiastic mother. Uh, you know, I like to cook, you know, I, 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 I like my body. <laughs> I like things of the body. And Aristotle, unlike everybody else in antiquity, and they were all men, of course, <laughs> sort of put down the physical and emotional side of life as sort of female and, 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 and difficult. He didn't at all. So just take anger, for example. He said that, of course, if you get angry inappropriately and in excess, that's a vice, of course. But he says the person incapable of anger 
it can never be an effective moral agent. Mm -hmm. If you do not get angry, <laughs> if your child is bullied at school, right, and, and use that anger to get to the head teacher's office and get something done about it, then you are an ineffective moral agent. You are deficient. You need some anger, right? Nelson Mandela needed to be angry about yeah. apartheid. <laughs> If he hadn't been angry, then he'd have sat being chief of his particular branch of the Zulus in his hut um, for his entire life. Do you know, this was so liberating to me when I read this. Um, I was about 22 um, and having been brought up in a very strict oh, Protestant uh, yeah. faith where all emotion and, and pride. All right. So there's modesty, things like modesty. And this. People find English people as well, or British people. I mean, people brought in, up in British culture. We overvalue modesty. Now, that is not does not mean I like boasting, right? So he would say at one end, there's people who just brag and boast and are full of excessive self-confidence, which isn't uh, realistically in tune with their actual abilities, all right? On the other end, though, you've got people who... If you were on a desert island <laughs> and you, they knew that they were a very good cook, who wouldn't say, I am a very good cook, shall I do the cooking, right? <laughs> they wouldn't just say, I am good at this thing, right? Because false modesty. And again, I think gender comes in there as well. Women are very much brought up in, in British culture to understate their true abilities. No, my wife so actually I, mentions this. Uh, she sorry? says... My wife mentions this. She says, like, how do men have so much confidence? <laughs> well, well, she because well, we've been browbeaten that we're not attractive if we um, just stay what we're good at. So the simple, the right thing in the middle, what Aristotle called Tomesson, this mid medium ground and everything, it's not to be have false modesty where you don't, you're not clear with people what you can and cannot do, nor false boasting. But, you know, I... If I was on the Dancing Island, I would say, well, there's many, many things I can't do at all, but I'm quite a good cook. I can teach you as much as I can remember of ancient Greek literature and philosophy. Um, and I'm a good swimmer. Right. Most of the other things I can't do. So we'd, we'd all need to do that. And so I try to live my life as if I was on that desert island and get everybody, boys and girls, just to describe factually what they're good at. And what they're not because then they're much more useful to themselves and other citizens but aristotle goes one step further and here we get back to pleasure because he says the things that you're going to be good at and every human is different the thing that you are going to be good at when you grow up as it were and therefore probably the thing you should try to monetize is the one that gives you most pleasure he actually talks he's, he was a parent he talks about sad little children he's known who've been told they have to become mathematicians who hate maths and love playing their musical instruments <laughs> so his advice really implicit with for parents it's very very useful is to expose your kids to as many different stimuli as you can and just see what it is that they really enjoy what they enjoy not what you think they ought to be like a dentist or a lawyer or an accountant right uh, and try and support them in that and that is you're quite right this is related to his teleology but another core word for him is dunamis now dunamis means your uh, potential okay. okay now as a species we've all got potential little babies to grow into full-grown healthy educated adult homines sapientes but we also have an individual dunamis every single human has an, a different cocktail of abilities and talents and that the real path to happiness is to identify that quite not necessarily i mean you know, some people don't get there till they're 40 or 50 but to find that and then be able to develop it because you will thereby get both be excellent you will have become the best possible version of yourself that you can and it sounds to me like you're at an age where you're really saying to yourself what is that right 
and I was about your age, believe it or not, I was 27 before I decided to go back and do a PhD and be an academic. It was that late. You know, I, I just realized that my talents, which were, I have a good analytical brain. I'm not boasting. I have a good analytical when brain. You you did philosophy. And, I'm go- and I'm good at communication. Okay. Those mm-hmm. are my two strongest suit. Obviously being an academic was the best way for me to try to make the world a better place. I would have loved to be an opera singer, but I couldn't sing. <laughs> you know, we've got a fantasy career yeah. that uh, we, could, we couldn't do. So this word dunamis is fascinating and I'm very annoyed because Alfred Nobel used it for dynamite, which is a very destructive thing, right? Whereas well, actually dynamite, human dynamite, means if everybody on the planet had had their potential nurtured, their true dunamis nurtured, uh, which needs all the things that we all need as a species, like enough to eat, lots of cuddles, literacy, a roof over our heads, at least one proper relationship with an adult. You know, there are these, you have to have those even to survive. But then on top of that, one way or another, you find out what it is you're really, really good at. And I can honestly say that I have enjoyed 85% of my job. I mean, how many people can say they were having pleasure 85% of the time? I think we all could if we could figure out a better system. (laughs) We all put terrible pressure on children to to, to get their exams by certain ages. I mean, it's it's mad. Our educational system is, I think, insane. You've touched on a few things which I want to pick up on. <laughs> One of the first that you mentioned is um, how Aristotle comes to understand what virtues are. And he said it's not binary. I found that quite interesting because uh, I think this is perhaps one of the examples where um, Greek philosophy, Aristotelian philosophy, intersects with Islamic theology in some sense. Because Islam also, it? Had, yeah, it doesn't do the um, sexual desires as sin. It says in marriage, like everyone feels sexual desire. Yeah. In marriage, it's good. Outside marriage, bad. That's, it's like it's based on the actions. So I think that's one example where um, the classical Islamic scholars picked up Greek's works and used it to kind of formulate different arguments in different ways. Not not denying the fact that we are actually animals. I mean, Aristotle yeah. was the first Greek philosopher to say we weren't made out of clay by the gods. We are animals. We're advanced animals, and we've got special things that make us, hu- you know, human. Mm-hmm including the ability to do philosophy, but denying our animal nature. And that's why Darwin loved him so much, because he sat around saying, what actually makes us different from other apes, right? We are an ape, but what makes us different from other apes? So, and again, that's also much more accommodating to women who've Mm -hmm. so often been dismissed as, you know, when I was a little girl, women couldn't be priests in the, in the Church of England. And I was actually told it was because I was impure. Oh, wow. And no, I know. But I mean, that, that, that was in a, a modern liberal social democracy in the 1960s, that because we have this extraordinary power to create life, <laughs> basically, this sort of estrogenic power, uh, and we bleed, that that meant we couldn't deliver the... Re- the Eucharist, we would actually taint it. That, that's in, Christ, in Christianity. Um, there's even, I found when I was a little girl in church, in the Co- Book of Common Prayer, which is the writ book of rituals for Anglicanism. It's not the Bible, but it's the book with the form of all the ritual. There's a ritual called shriving. A shriving is what happens to a woman after she's given birth before she's allowed back over the, the threshold. <laughs> and so I'm sure I would have rejected Christianity if I had been a boy but it, it was actually partly being a little girl I wasn't allowed to sing in the choir I was the best singer in my family amongst the children by yeah. far actually but my two brothers got to sing in the church choir because girls voices were impure uh, what what does that say to a small human that you're just dirty <laughs> so this is one of the main reasons that it I, around the age of 13, I just could not yeah. believe a word of it anymore. I did not I believe a why, good... Uh, it appeals to you. I, I did not believe a good God would hold those opinions of me. I just didn't. Mm-hmm. 
No, that's yeah, fair enough. Because you you would think that um, if God created the world and knows us best, humanity, he his laws would encourage that that good life, right? Exactly. So it better um, for everyone, not just men and women. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's part of what I'm trying to understand from it, from the <laughs> perspective. Just is is that the case really the case, and how is that uh, actualized that good life from the Islamic perspective? Because I do think there's a bit too much ritualization in religion and um, a bit too superficial. It's not, uh, at least the way it's presented, because um, I think part of the issue with Islam is that um, a lot of it uh, is, is translated from medieval theology and Muslims haven't really progressed their faith. They haven't okay, thought new circumstances, let's think differently. Rather, they just think these are the medieval opinions and we'll just debate the medieval opinions all the time rather than innovate new uh, new ways of thinking. I think yeah. that stifles... I mean, uh, my impression is from, from different Muslim friends I've had that there's just... Just as in Christianity, though, there are very doctrinaire people who yes. rely very much on the written word of the Quran or the Bible. Uh, and there are other far more enlightened Muslims and Christians who will have a philosophical discussion like this at any time uh, and I wouldn't like to sort of categorize any one faith as any more doctrinaire than other to be perfectly honest with you I mean, um, that for me it stopped working I needed to and I had seven very bad years between 13 and 21 uh, because having accepted this rule book right this rule book of Christianity that you could literally on any issue look up the right answer. <laughs> um, having rejected that, I had no rule book in its place. I simply didn't know how to behave because society, say capitalism was telling me to get as much for myself as I possibly could and get ahead, right? Yeah. If you don't believe you'll be punished after death for being selfish, then it's a very good question. Why try to be unselfish? Mm -hmm. It's only when I realized that actually I was more likely to be happy uh, through, through, through reading ethics, that it, it, was a, it was a better bet for me, just in this one life I think I have, that I'll be happier. But I think that there is a really big problem worldwide at the moment with um, some countries have, have gone very theocratic and, uh, oppress people who don't obey exactly the rule book that they're told to. We see this right now in Iran mm -hmm. with these poor women um, who, who don't want to be told to cover their heads the whole time. Um, but other parts of the world, I mean, in Britain, only about one in 10 people uh, goes to either a mosque or a church or a synagogue or a temple. There's broadly speaking, a secular country in, in practice which means that I think people are very confused. I think teenagers are very confused about um, moral choices and what is the point of being a good person because nothing has come along to replace the much, the sort of, until it, the, an anthropologist and sociologist date that for Britain to, to about the 1960s, that most people still believed in something like the Anglican God. Mm -hmm in Britain until the 1960s, uh, and most people just don't. So I think we that's where the, there is such huge room for discussion of secular ethics, preferably with people like you who are enlightened people of faith. I'm not sure if I'm enlightened or not. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see about that one when I'm on my deathbed. <laughs> well, you're enlightened enough to talk to me. Yeah. You when know, I, this is... Uh, uh, Aristotle mentions, um, when he talks about the good life, he mentions the political life and the reflective life, and he mentions both are obviously good, the better is the reflective. I can see you've done a lot of reflection <laughs> in yours. Um, but the, I, I do do an awful lot of thinking, and that's what I'm saying. It, it does take a lot of commitment. And I'm very well aware that an awful lot of people just live on autopilot, and that's fine. And quite a lot of them are good people. <laughs> they they've just probably been brought up in happy families yeah. reasonably happy families where they've had good examples 
which they have unconsciously absorbed good examples, completely unconsciously on an autopilot. And they very rarely have to sit and make a very serious moral decision. Now, none of that applied to me. I didn't have a particularly happy childhood. Um, I had some in my extended family, very bad moral examples. <laughs> and um, I didn't, I felt I've had to think my way to, through it, but that is not for everybody at all. And Aristotle says that, he says some of the best people he know, he knows are like ordinary farmers who just get up in the morning and look after their farms, but they're good people. So it isn't for everybody. Yeah, because these are, would you say that, why is it not for everyone? Are some people are not predisposed towards- Reflection. reflection. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Um, that's, that, that's just me. In, in, in the New Testament, we have, it's the story of the two disciples of Jesus called Martha and Mary. Uh, and my mother, who is sadly no longer with us, but was a, definitely a very good person. She was kind, unselfish, constructive, joyous, um, always there when you needed her. To, you know, she was a morally excellent agent. But she thought thinking about it was a complete waste of time. And it was for sort of self-indulgent narcissists. <laughs> I mean... And, and she regarded herself as Martha, who, when Jesus went to their house, would set about cooking, right? And then there's the Mary, who would sit around having philosophical discussions. <laughs> um, and she would say, well, you're a Mary and I'm, I'm, I'm a Martha. And I, th I think there is some sense in it. And I might have been a much happier person if I was a Martha, but I'm not. Well, I suppose society needs people of different uh, attitudes. Exactly. That is... Yeah. And that well, is actually, we'd have no need for each other. That is actually what, what that parable is saying, I think. Because I still like the old stories. Yeah, no, they're wonderful stories. Well, my favourite of all is the Good, the good Samaritan, because it doesn't actually make me cry that mm. people of his own ethnic group walk past him, but somebody of a different ethnic group went to help him because he was another human being. I mean, these simple old stories still guide my life even though I don't I've renounced the actual religious structure around them yeah so that's the power of myth and uh, compelling stories they live with us forever um just a final question then what advice would you have to someone in their 20s um, thinking about idomenia and living a good life <laughs> um I, I would actually, it's, you don't have to put this in the podcast, I would actually recommend they have a go at my book because what I've tried to do for the first time, nobody's ever done it before, Aristotle's always been such an academic author, is explain his core ideas mm -hmm. in ways that anybody who can read 220 pages of middle brow English prose, right, can absorb. That would be one quick way in. The key concepts are finding what you're out, you know, thinking about what the best possible version of yourself would be. So facing your faults and trying to correct them, thinking through all your characteristics. I did this in the Eudemian ethics. He actually gives you like a questionnaire list of them all. And I found out that, you know, when I was really dogged by, I love revenge, right? <laughs> I, it's it's true, and I've been so much happier since I have made a very conscious effort to let things go, right? Mm -hmm. Much much happier. I used to nurture grudges against people, which meant means you're living in the past, not not the future. But everybody will have a different vice that they realise they've got to work on. I was also, you know, I squandered money. I was both on myself and other people. I, I, I just had, took no financial fiscal responsibility. And Aristotle talks about that. He says there are really mean people on one end who won't give a penny to a dying beggar. There are ridiculous people on the other who have no control, right? So they can't be good for their families. And then there is exactly the right thing, which is fiscal prudence plus generosity in the middle 
right? So you need to identify what, what you're going to work on. And you also need to think really hard and be brave about what, if you could be or do anything, what would it be? Now, you may well have to curtail that. I did. I couldn't be an opera singer. <laughs> but I found a career that I could do a lot of performance in. <laughs> a lot of communication, quite a theatrical career being a lecturer, right? Um, if you really go against what your gut tells you through the pleasure you feel, then you will not be able to achieve happiness. And I think the third thing is, is really investing in good friendships. And our Aristotle includes friendship. Philia is called, just philia, like we use words phil for loving things, philanthropist. Uh, philia includes both your wife and your children and your friends. And he thinks that nobody can manage more than about 10 really intense relationships where you are always there for the other person. Apart from anything else, they'll start to compete. I've only actually got two children. And even with two, sometimes there's competition for what I can do for, for them. But old friends, he thinks, friends are worth the investment of every ounce of energy, that it's the most beautiful thing. And it's also something that animals don't really do. Animals tend to hang out only with their blood kin. Humans have this capacity. And that will also, that philia, although more dilute, if you feel that to all the people in your society, then you can build really a civic utopia, mm -hmm. right? So my advice is to pick your spouse very, very carefully. <laughs> Decide which friends are worth serious investment and then go out of your way to spend time with them. Decide what vices to, uh, well, decide what are your virtues as well. Yeah. What you're good at, what you're bad at, work on it. And do try to think every day whether there's anything that you're ashamed of having done. Don't berate yourself. You know, we don't have to flog ourselves for this. This is not a religion, but you can learn from that not to do it tomorrow, as it were. But that does require the equivalent of prayer. It requires meditation. Thank you. That is very, very good advice. <laughs> not too dissimilar from what I've heard from elderly people and uh, people of wisdom. No. Um, well, all I can say is it's worked for me. I've had my ups and my downs. And as a young woman, many, many downs. But um, I genuinely think by consciously using these Aristotelian principles, I've done the best I could with my life. You know, I think I'm the, not the very best version of myself I could be because that never stops. You know, that's on your deathbed. But I definitely think I'm happier uh, than I would have been if I hadn't tried to practice what I call virtue ethics. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Edith Hall. Thank you, Hamza.